Hello, and welcome back to the show. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. And I'm coming, you, I'm coming to you today from Chicago, David. You surprised me, because I think the whole week you were out skiing, and then the next thing you were, you were in Chicago. I don't know how that happened. Yes. You weren't skiing in Chicago, though. That's no, not possible. <laughs> no, Chicago got a lot of snow, but uh, I was skiing in Park City with some accountants, and uh, you might wonder how it, that is possible that we could all take off three days to go skiing. Well, you uh, can. You don't have tax clients in busy season, but how do these other accountants do it? Well, um, you know, it's a, it's a combination of they've either effectively delegated most of the client work to their teams, um, or they're going to catch up when they get back. That was one of the one of our uh, friends there. He took a, just a day to ski. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's. I don't know. This whole experience made me think: Why do we? Why do we have busy season? And it's like such a shame because I feel like if you're an accountant who likes to ski, you just like you can't do it. Like they're not compatible, and they should be. Good point. Yeah, that's right. You can never have that as a hobby. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> right? Like February and March are the best times to ski. Don't. I don't know. I don't know what you do. Um, but actually, I I I have I have a listener um sent us a message that I think uh, offers a potential solution. This is an email from Paul and Leanna White. Hi, David and Blake. My wife and I have a bookkeeping and fractional CFO advisory firm that serves small businesses in central VA. Our experience in the last three years of being in business is that most CPAs are creating more headaches and rework for themselves, bookkeepers, and potentially costing clients money by not professionally engaging with their clients' bookkeepers to ensure year-end journal entries are made in a timely fashion, or that inventory, assets, depreciation, and capital asset lists are properly maintained in the accounting system for balance sheet reporting, etc. With all the issues in the industry, uh, with burnout, overwork, and less available talent, it would seem that most CPAs would be moving towards a deeper level of engagement with professional bookkeepers versus sticking their heads in the sand, not returning calls slash emails related to these basic and foundational items needed for clients to have accurate financials on a timely basis in the accounting system. Is the issue that CPAs working with small businesses don't charge clients enough to warrant the extra effort to do things right? Or do they feel that they are above talking to third party bookkeeping firms or perhaps view them as a competitor? Would love it if you could do some episodes that explore both sides of this issue from the CPA and the bookkeeper's perspectives on this problem. Sincerely, Paul and Leanna White, PL Business Solutions. So I've got some thoughts on this, David, but I'm curious to hear what you think first. I mean, is it a little bit of like a business model thing where the accountants, they're not valuing the bookkeeping uh, experience, they're not valuing working with third party bookkeepers, not valuing the small business clients. It's just too much tax focus. Like the business, is it a business model thing? Like I'm not. Yeah, I think you're on the right track, right? Like a, a mix of products and services to diversify might solve this problem. If all you do is tax returns, then you're going to have a lot of workload compression. So one thing that differentiated the firms, uh, the firm owners that I was hanging out with is that they have an emphasis on bookkeeping, accounting, client accounting services, CAS, whatever you want to call it. And tax is there, but it's not the main thing. And if tax isn't the main thing, you're not going to have the same kind of compression. Sure, there's stuff that has to happen at the beginning of the year to close the books and all that, but it's not nearly as bad when, you know, 100% of what you do is tax. Yeah, and in, in this good, we've talked about this, the whole like surge pricing models. There's so many different models you could do to not have it be compressed. Yeah. Right? Automatically filing extensions for everybody. We, we beat this drum to death. Um, the, the, the beauty of doing the bookkeeping is that you can collect a lot of the information that you need to do a return all year. And if you're closing the books for the client every month or every quarter, then there's just so much less work that has to happen. Um, the actual tax return is, is taking the numbers you've already got and plugging them in in a lot of ways. And you can do the planning year round if you're meeting with the clients year round. I, I just don't understand why. If you're more... going to do business returns, it's crazy not to do business accounting right. stuff. Yeah. And I, I think one of the arguments against this uh, is that, oh, my clients aren't willing to pay for it, right? Um, and I don't think that's true. I think there's plenty of clients that are willing to pay for it. Um, 
also one of the arguments I heard in favor, like or not in favor, but like a, a, a rationalization for doing it this way is that you get a lot of like cleanup work in tax season and busy season, and you can charge very high rates for it because it has to get done. But if you actually do the math, the clients are getting a big discount when you do all the work at the end of the year instead of throughout the year. Even if you're charging two fifty an hour, whatever it is, right? They're still getting, they're still paying less than they would if they paid you year round. Yeah. So you might feel good to be billing a lot of hours, but you're not actually making the money you could be making if you did it year round. Yeah. So, so. I, I have two articles on business models that I saw this week, and I wanted to get your two cents a little bit on these, and. But the, it's really good because it relates to you kind of led into it. So I didn't know you were going to come to the show with some questioning business models on busy season. So do you want to talk about prom or coffee? Prom or coffee? Well, I'm going to a wedding tonight. So um, maybe prom okay. since I'm going to be dressed up, you know. So you've ever heard of David's Bridal? Uh, yes, yes. So. They, it's, your, uh, it's your side business, right, Dave? It's my side business, yes, that I started in 1950. Yeah. And they've uh, provided wedding dresses basically to 70 million people for the last, you know, 70 years. Yeah. And, but they've had their ups and downs. In 2018, they filed for bankruptcy. Then they just this past April filed for bankruptcy again. But now they were purchased by private equity. And they've started a new program. They're playing the long game. So they've started a program called Diamond Prom Loyalty Program, and they're targeting high schoolers. And the way they do this, it's a, it's a program, a discount card, and they bundle together, you know, accessories, your prom dress, the alterations, give you a discount for future alterations if you need them, right? And they're, because ultimately they want that long-term relationship to turn into a wedding dress sale eventually. And I was just, you know, and they currently have 2 million members in this prom loyalty program. So they're setting the table for their 2 million future customers, essentially. So I was kind of thinking this, like, how do firms get lifetime customers early? Like, you can't just do, like, tax returns for free when they're teenagers because those want free tax returns when they're adults, right? But, like, like how, do you, how do you get younger people as customers and keep them for life if you're a firm? That's a good question. Um, I feel like there's got to be an answer. I wonder if any of our listeners have a have a solution. Anybody in the chat? Yeah, you thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone who joined the live stream. Clearly, you're putting in some hours on a Saturday as we record here. Um, since I was out of town, we're doing it on Saturday. Tyler says we are a BK first firm, bookkeeping first firm that offers taxes, and only twenty percent of our clients take us up on it. The clients that use us for taxes have better tax liability projections and have their returns ready first. Great to see you, Jesse. Good to have you here. Edgar said regarding the uh, um, skiing, if you like to ski, that you should work in industry and then you'll have February and March open. Deborah, happy weekend to you. And Tyler says, amen. I assume that was to the, um, I don't know what that was, but... <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it, Tyler. That you went on vacation. You went skiing. Oh, that I went on vacation, yeah. yes. Uh, I'm so sore. Um, hey, but David, going back to uh, uh, this busy season thing, uh, part of the reason I've been thinking about this a lot is because actually KPMG was featured in the Financial Times. They are looking to take the pain out of auditing busy season. Um, and the way they're going to do this, or well, actually, they say that they've made progress. Um, KPMG said the number of people working more than 50 hours in total across the eight weekends of busy season for public company auditors fell from almost one third three years ago to less than one fifth last year. And it is on course to reduce it further in 2024. 29% of staff worked no weekends at all last year, up from 18% two years before. So 29% of staff did not work any weekends last year. Just to, before you go deeper the article, I'm just stepping back and thinking about the big firms like KPMG. Haven't they historically over the last 10 years slowly been shifting more to just advisory and consulting mm -hmm. and less? Mm -hmm. Like, is this a decrease because, yes, that, you're going to answer this hopefully, but my brain's already going. Is this a decrease because they have some, 
massive efficiency or gain in business season, or is this a decrease because they just don't do the work anymore? <laughs> they just like, stopped. What's the reason? They just stopped doing. Um, well, here's what caused the change. Yep. Uh, they they put in place targets two years ago to finish certain percentages of audit work for large company, uh, large public company clients by deadlines in October and December, and they they will cut the pay of senior executives if those targets are not met. So they're lining up the uh, the the objectives with compensation, right? Yep. So money talks. Money makes money changes behavior. Here's a quote from Scott Flynn, vice chair for audit at KPMG US. We needed to take some of the top off the mountain in January, February, and March. Younger people think about work-life balance differently than we did when I was starting out, and so we've tried to meet our professionals where we think they need to be met. Also, my work at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. is not as good as my work at 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., especially not in January and February. I mean, I like the way this guy is thinking, right? Not every hour is equal. <laughs> so it's unbelievably logical like, to yeah, do this, right? Right. But, but. Now, now, they got a long way to go, right? 29%. Only 29% didn't work any weekends in busy season. So, you know, like we need to flip that. Uh, but it's progress. I think as a profession, we're going to eventually get away from this. And there's also regulatory changes that we can advocate for to, to do this as well. Uh, you know, for example, um, moving the deadlines or uh, allowing accounting firms to spread out the deadlines for their clients or change the tax years. Like in New Zealand, uh, you can, uh, uh, firms have flexibility to change tax years with clients in a way that we just don't, so that you could take your smaller clients that are less risky, and you can, you know, spread out that work. Like we could advocate for this as a profession. It doesn't have to be the way it is, um, just because it's been I, I, I that way. Every other year, tax returns could be an interesting. You know, you've cut the volume in half now. Yeah, for everybody. but but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking yeah. about like not everybody has to file on the same deadline. Yeah, you know, we could, it could, it could. There could be some way to uh, change the payment deadlines, change the tax filing deadlines, so that they're staggered throughout the year. Like this is doable. Other countries do this, so, um, and I'm very, I, I'm very pro this now because I, I feel like the the number one most damaging thing in accounting is that workload compression because it means that you sacrifice everything for a certain time during the year, and you can't make progress on innovation during that time. And so it all waits until you have the time. And then when you have the time, you're burned out and you're tired. So you don't want to do any of that stuff. So that's what holds us back. Um, the best, the best time in my life has been now when I've got this very steady schedule where it's kind of the same, you know, every week in and out, I can really make progress on my goals. I can really, you know, get physically fit. I can take trips. Uh, I don't stress out. Like it makes a humongous difference. Yeah, the more the more you stabilize things, you know, have these extremes. Because if you have this extreme three months of working nonstop, you tend to dip and don't do anything to recover, right? And yeah, staying yeah. keeping in that band of uh, variability. David says the IRS could stagger due dates based on your last name. It could be your birth date. It could be your social security number. I don't know. There's probably lots of ways to do this, right? So uh, I I I don't I don't know why we don't do this. What else we got this week, David? Uh, I, I can talk about the coffee because you like your you like coffee and you like some subscriptions. You like the subscription revenue, right? I love subscription models. I love coffee. Tell me. So have you been what, to the UK? What, what does this have to do with accounting? <laughs> have you been to the UK? Uh, I have never been to right, the so UK. So they have a place called Pret a Manger, and think about it. It's like a, if a QT gas station got rid of the gas and merged with a Starbucks. It's like quick takeaway sandwiches, takeaway food, coffee. Well, they recently rolled out a subscription model for their coffee services. So essentially in the U.S., you get five free barista-made drinks for 40 bucks a month, basically using U.S. prices. But what they've discovered since they rolled this out, their transactions growth has grown over 36% a month after launching. Because the average person that gets this membership is hitting the coffee chain approximately 28 times a month compared to a person that's not a member who just hits, the, who only has like two transactions a month. 
Twenty um, times a month. That's like they're going like every day. Almost basically every day, right? Yeah. And then even Panera here in the states, because a couple of different U.S. coffee places in the states have also done this model, and they have Panera has like an unlimited sip club, which you get a free coffee every two hours for twelve bucks a month. But they've said that what they've done is that's converted kind of casual customers to loyal customers. Yep. To where now they're coming in more often. So it's again like this is like you know. Obviously, we've talked about how a bookkeeping subscription could help keep people in the door to sell them a tax and advising. But, yeah. like, are there other things accounting firms can do to offer a cheap subscription on a monthly basis to that you it'll benefit you in other places, right? It's just yeah. not the, the subscription. Absolutely. I mean, you could offer subscriptions for virtually anything. I think the thing that uh, firm owners are scared about is my clients will use it too much. They will take advantage of me. And unlike coffee, where the cost of that commodity is really, really low, so for me, serving an extra cup of coffee is incrementally nothing, right? Yeah. It's the rent. It's all the fixed costs. It's all the labor that I have to have that, that makes a coffee shop expensive. But those are, in many ways, relatively fixed costs. So if I sell a subscription, right, I'm not, my costs aren't increasing that much when people use it more. In an accounting firm, you think, oh, but if I if I get more hours from all these people, now suddenly I'm going to be screwed, right? Well, there's a really easy way to solve that, uh, and it's simply to make your prices adjustable on a monthly or even weekly basis. So if you have a client that signs up for a subscription that starts to use it way more than you expected and take up a lot of your team's time, you have in the engagement letter that you can change their pricing at any time with X days notice. It could be no notice, right? You could say next week your price is going up. So there really is very little risk. What's the risk? A few days? You know, one week? That's and, and how you I, deal I, with it. And I imagine it'll ebb and flow because that, that client may have some situation going on in their life where they need a lot of extra help. But then for the next two years, they might never reach out to you. But they're still charging right. you every month. But yeah, and if you have enough clients, then it all evens out. Yeah. And these models, I mean, this is how you know Amazon, Costco. This is just gravy money. If you can get some sort of like hundred and thirty dollar fee from your clients every year to be a member of your firm or whatever, it's just they're lo they're loyal to your business. But then you're just taking gravy money. It's mm -hmm. it's like free money sitting on the table. So yep. Um, Edgar in the live stream asked, are accounting technology jobs more balanced? It really depends. If you're working in payroll, then your December is, is kind of a mess, right? Um, but like, or a payroll tech company because you're signing up people. But I would say yes, on the whole, uh, when I made the leap into accounting technology, my schedule was much smoother, more spread out. Um, Conference season can get kind of busy if you travel to conferences. I don't like that. I actually made a, a resolution this year to travel less for work. So we're cutting back on the number of conferences we go to, which makes sense because we can just do this here, David, in the, in the cloud from anywhere, Where? right? Where? Here I am. I'm in a hotel in Chicago. Can anyone tell the difference? I can add on to Edgar's answer here. Um, this. When I was at Intuit, I was on the payroll team. And pay, again, like, payroll is like every single week. The whole payroll team's moving billion dollars in payroll a week at the time it was. And I was always jealous of TurboTax because TurboTax would like be really busy. They'd have a compressed busy season, but yeah. then it would be quiet. And then they'd have like nine months to innovate and do all this cool stuff with their product. And the payroll team like never got that that nice downtime for months at a time because you were just you just went from W two ten nine nine season to payroll, 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 nine forty one season and you just didn't have that. So it is depending on the, the tech, right? So I guess it comes down to no deadlines. You want to get out of deadlines. <laughs> that's that's how you have smooth have, have a smooth life. But we're a deadline driven profession, David. You know, that's that's the challenge. Even with the podcast, we try to do it we're doing it every week. There's always this deadline. It creates a little bit of stress every week. I'm right. But imagine if we had to record like fifty of these in three months, right? And then we <laughs> didn't do worse. Yes. We didn't do the rest for the rest of the year. I feel like doing it every week is is not bad a at all. A little bit easier. That's true. Um Brandon in the live stream really liked your idea of every other year returns. Hey, maybe for smaller clients, that makes a lot of sense, right? Why why not? Uh, he also said tiered subscriptions based on client needs would be ideal. No one size fits all. 
and Edgar asked, if you started over in accounting tech today, where would you look for jobs? Ooh. Uh, probably AI <laughs> accounting apps. Yeah. That's That sounds like a great place to be right now. We just did a bonus interview with the guys at Rightworks who are building that wrapper for ChatGPT for accountants. And that's a great interview. Go check that out. A lot of cool things happening over at Rightworks. Maybe that team is hiring. I have an update because of that interview. Okay. So we, we did the interview, released the episode, and then micro, we said something in there incorrectly about Microsoft's new uh, uh, Copilot product. Apparently now they did release it. They're calling it Copilot Pro, and it's available to anybody now for 20 bucks a month. It used to be just more expensive, and mm -hmm. they're only offering it to big corporations. But since we recorded that episode, Microsoft has released Copilot Pro for 20 bucks. And since we released that episode, uh, ChatGPT came out with their subscription aimed at small teams. It's called ChatGPT Team, designed for small to medium-sized teams of up to 149 members. It includes a dedicated workspace and administrative tools for team management. And really importantly for accountants, anybody you put on this team plan, their prompts will not be used to train the model. So you've always been able to do that through the API, which is what Rightwork Spark does. It sends it through the API. The terms are different. That data is not retained by OpenAI. It's not used to train the model. This is now the same as that. So if you've got your team using ChatGPT at $20 a month, you can now upgrade to ChatGPT team. It's $30 per month. Or if you pay annually, it's $25 per user per month. So it's a little more expensive, but makes a lot of sense if you we get are the management, we get administration, we get some extra security, if you want to call it, use the word security and privacy. So because right now, I think as on our own company, we have seven separate ChatGPT subscriptions. So <laughs> yep. we, we probably need to look into this for ourselves. Okay. I, it's on my list to do as soon as uh, as soon as I get back home. And then I have a Claude one. And now, yeah, it's starting to <laughs> couple subscriptions everywhere. Speaking of AI, David, I saw this really fascinating study, a comparison of Waymo rider-only crash data to human benchmarks at 7.1 million miles. I heard about this. Yes, so, so Waymo, have you seen the Waymo cars driving around Phoenix? Yes. Do they have them in Tucson? They don't have them in Tucson. I have a theory why they train these cars in Phoenix. Well, tell me your theory. If anybody who's not been to Phoenix, Phoenix is a master plan community. Every single road is a perfect square, straight road, one mile squares. And I'm like, if you, I'm less impressed with cars that can drive around Phoenix. Like, okay, Tucson's well, it's older, the roads are crooked, it's like harder. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but it's still impressive because I think yeah. they're, they're using comparisons of Phoenician drivers to <laughs> Waymo cars. So, like, the terrain may be easier, but we're still, you know, people. we still crash, people right? Robots, we're yeah. still people. And, um, uh, so what's really fascinating about this is that it, it's, it's the, these, these Waymo self-driving cars with the big cameras on top, the radar systems, they have now driven seven, over 7 million miles. And this data comes from official National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reports that Waymo is required to submit on any crashes. And the human benchmarks come from research papers that estimate overall crash rates for human drivers in the same cities as the Waymo vehicles operate. So like I said, comparing Phoenician drivers to Phoenician Waymo vehicles. And prior to now, they just didn't have enough miles to make comparisons worthy, I think. Is that right. The, yeah. you, need, you needed a lot of, of, of data. And check this out. When you consider all locations, the Waymo cars, the automatic system, had an 85% lower any injury crash rate and 57% lower police reported crash rate than humans. This means the Waymo vehicles had between two and seven times fewer crashes resulting in injuries or police reports compared to human driver crash rate estimates. So the Waymo system is way safer than human drivers. It's not perfect, they still crash, but they crash at a far less rate, it's far smaller rate, far lower rate. And uh, what does it have to do with 
AI and accounting, David? Well, my point is that AI doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than humans. And when you look at professions like audit, where we have really low audit quality and we have massive audit failures, I don't think it's going to take that much for current AI to do a better job than human auditors. If it only is only 50% good, it's still probably doing more. Yeah, well, considering that like the PCAOB is coming out with a report soon that finds something like 40 to 50% of audits are extremely deficient. So that's even with all the busy season hours that we're putting in. So I think, I think the point is AI doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than a really tired human being at 10 or 11 p.m. at night. And I think uh, this article is almost a month old. It's been kind of hanging around. Um, but the IRS, uh, they spotted $37.1 billion in tax and financial crimes. And they basically, because they've seized now 1.7 petabytes of digital data from 3,300 computer devices. And they've found a lot of this using AI. So they're applying AI on top of financial tractions to help identify fraud. So you're right. It, can't, it doesn't have to catch all the fraud. But, hey, if it can connect, catch billions, it's pretty good. Yeah. What else do we have in the world of AI? I've got a big list here. We haven't had a chance to get to it. Um, I've seen some very interesting, um, like contradictory data. Here's a headline that was in accounting today back in November. Survey finds 37% of finance leaders have already laid off workers due to AI. This was a survey conducted by Resume Builder which included 750 business leaders from companies that currently use or plan to implement AI by 2024. And it found that 37% of respondents have already dismissed employees due to AI adoption. That really surprises me. I wonder who are these employees that are getting laid off because AI has replaced them. And I saw an article this week that said that the title was 25% of CEOs expect AI to lead to job cuts in 2024. Mm-hmm. And this is a survey done by um, PwC ahead of the uh, Davos Economic Forum. And they said it would lead to job cuts of at least 5% this year. Um, and the leaders that are saying this are in the media and entertainment, banking, insurance, and logistics fields. So you know what I wonder? I wonder if like a lot of these are layoffs that are being done for financial reasons. Because we've seen you know a lot of layoffs this year due to the need to cut back, and AI is just the excuse. I'm trying to think like the psychological part of this. So you get laid off, right? And you're gonna go and tell people you got laid off. Isn't it nicer to tell people like, I got laid off, bad luck, AI took my job, instead of just like, those, they just cut me, <laughs> right? Is, it, is, it, is this a psychological game on both, end, both sides, yeah. the people making the cuts and the people receiving the cuts? I don't know. Did you see the news that uh, the SEC approved crypto ETFs? So you can you can buy Bitcoin on the stock market now, David. So instead of buying like I think an ETF something like the QQQ and that automatically puts me into like the entire Nasdaq, right? I can buy like a something similar that just puts me into crypto without me buying crypto. Yeah, same so, way you can buy uh, like gold, right? You don't actually okay. have to buy gold bars. Okay. You just buy the ETF, the ETF and now okay. you've got your your You've got exposure to gold. Same thing with Bitcoin. Um, I was thinking a lot about this because we have been, you know, big crypto skeptics recently, or not recently, over the last many years. And I was thinking, like, is this is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I actually think it's a good thing. I've come to the conclusion that the SEC did the right thing here but not because it's a good investment. I still think it's a terrible investment. <laughs> I, I think it's a good thing though, because it's better to have people making this investment on a regulated exchange in a, a way that protects them in some respects, right? They're, it may not protect them from making a bad investment, but at least it protects them from frauds. Well, and it, 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 I guess it uh, smooths the curve because I think if it, right now, 
prior to this, if you want to invest in crypto, there's 2,000 choices. And you hopefully you pick the right one. And now you're kind of in, if, if you believe in crypto overall, you now have a safe way to spread out your risk a little bit because you're investing. Yeah. Well, in and, a but category of crypto. Right? You're also not investing on some like unregulated exchange. Right, you're you're investing yeah, on a, a regular harder for fraud to happen, much harder. Yeah, yeah much yeah. harder, right? Um, Brian says, "I totally agree, Blake." Thanks for thanks for joining us today, Brian. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about why I think it's a, a terrible investment. <laughs> you know, I I still can't see the like to me the only the, the value of crypto, the reason people invest in it is because you believe it's going to go up in the future. Now, you could say that about any stock, right? But I cannot, I cannot identify any intrinsic value in Bitcoin. So other than the speculative value, other than the idea that it will continue to go up because other people will buy it, the greater fool theory, right? There's somebody else will spend, will pay more to me in the future than what I paid, right? That's the greater fool theory. Um, there's nothing there's nothing backing the value of bitcoin and well except for one one thing which is criminal activity right the, the number one like real world use case of bitcoin is not as a currency which is what it was promised to be it's as a way to launder money or to get money out of places where you're not allowed to move it normally like China. And I saw this crazy story in the New York Times. This NYU student owns a $6 million crypto mine. His secret is out. And where does he own this at? Where is that? It's a physical picture you have here. Yes. So this is a picture of a crypto mine. If you've ever wondered what a crypto mine looks like, it's a plot of land with a bunch of electrical poles uh, in Texas kind of middle of nowhere, Texas. And um, it's a bunch of what look like... I would have guessed chicken coops. <laughs> <laughs> Except they're holding racks of, uh, of servers. Servers. Of like, of, of mining computers. And how did Jerry Yu manage to own a crypto mine, a $6 million crypto mine in Texas? He's second generation rich. He has a Connecticut prep school education. He lives in a Manhattan condominium bought for $8 million. Less, I'm less impressed now. <laughs> but basically, um, his, we assume his family transferred you know, the money to him. It's like Bitcoin, right, across state borders. And, and he, he used that money, not purchasing this facility with dollars. He bought it with cryptocurrency. <laughs> so all this money is moving out of China now, because China's having, uh, 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 I, I think China's headed for a, a, a deep recession. They, they have some serious economic problems, right? With the population decline, with the real estate bubble popping, and all of these wealthy people in China are trying to get their money out. And you can't do it through normal channels, so how are you doing it? You're buying crypto. So that's what's propping up the value they're of- using, They're using it as a rail. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a, as a pipe on a pipe or a rail yeah yeah and so, that's why i always thought the utility is i was like, but for me like it was always like micro payments and we've talked about this before in the podcast where maybe people could pay us um 10 cents per minute of listening to our podcast something like that but now that the fed now the uh, treasury's released fed now and the it, t it costs pennies to send instant payments on the fed now network maybe that defeats the purpose of having to use blockchain or bitcoin to move money around Right. Yeah, well, Bitcoin is, utility, is yeah. terribly inefficient. You know, it costs. I don't know. The last time I looked at it, it cost, you know, tens of dollars to, <laughs> to make a Bitcoin transaction. Right, not pennies. So, it's not ever going to be a currency. It's it, the best it is is it's like a medium of exchange, and as soon as there's no longer this, at some point, right. I don't know, maybe, maybe there will always be this market for like illegal activity, but if it ever gets shut down um, or there, be, there are better alternative develops, then what's the value, right? What's the intrinsic value of a Bitcoin? I mean, to me, it's zero, ultimately, long term. I don't know when that's going to be, but it seems like zero. 
So can you imagine though, like if you live in this like tiny Texas town <laughs> where like the biggest business in your town is this crypto mine that some like NYU student owns? Well, I think some of the arguments long term that are opposite of yours, Blake, is that, oh, this is what's going to be important when, you know, the U.S. completely collapses, collapses, that you'll still have your Bitcoin because the U.S. dollar will be worthless. But I'm thinking if the U.S. economy completely collapses, you probably don't have electricity to even access your Bitcoin. <laughs> like, like, like we are probably at that point where you couldn't even utilize your Bitcoin because there's no electricity because yeah, society that's, is completely collapsed. Yeah. We are. That, that's the other argument is like, yeah, you're, you're betting on the collapse of the uh, U.S. dollar. But I, I, I wouldn't bet on that, right? Like, it, you know, the U.S. has a lot of problems, but we're still by far the most powerful country in the world, yeah. right? Like um, the most eligible leper in the colony. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's uh, there's, no other, there's no other country that can come close to offering the economic stability and the free markets and the, the you know rule of law that we have i suppose that could all change but it doesn't i don't see it happening even if donald trump is reelected as president um i just i just i don't see it you know like the i don't i don't buy the fearmongering i'm not i don't take i'm not i don't take sides in this I've decided to sit out this election, <laughs> you know, I, but I, I don't see that changing. So speaking of stock or investing, um, this is a little bit of follow up from the UK postal scandal story from last week. Fujitsu shares have dropped nearly 4%. Um, and it's mostly due to their European CEO, Paul Patterson. He, uh, this January, so ever since his television show was broadcast, um, so let's summarize what happened for the summer. listeners who so, missed it, right? So, so if you haven't listened, go back and listen to our episode from last week. I would argue it's one of the most shocking and important stories we've probably covered. Like, it, it, and it's still like just weighing on my brain this story. But essentially, what happened is in the UK for 20 years there was a software bug that caused um, postal masters at these independent. I would argue that kind of franchises of the U.S. Post, U.K. Postal Service to be accused of theft. 700 people are put in jails. There's divorces. There's suicides. It's just a catastrophe of justice that's occurred for 20 years. And the, the accounting software that causes this or the point of sale is owned by a company called Fujitsu, who those of you probably know about the scanners. But yes, yeah, so go back and listen to the episode. But there was a TV show that recently came out and it's, it's really surfaced this whole problem up to, to the radar of millions of people. So now, obviously, the House of Commons in the UK, they're, they're calling testimonies, bringing people in, trying to understand, like, how did this go on for so long? And uh, they took a 4% hit because they um, it's looking like they're going to compensate hundreds of sub-postmasters that were wrongly prosecuted. And the, he said that this is a moral obligation. So... Nobody knows how much this could be, but like I know we talked about before, I think it's, there's billions that have been paid to Fujitsu by the UK Postal Service, so they, they have the money. And I think they're a $40 billion a year mm -hmm. company anyway. So the money's there. We'll see kind of where that uh, cuts into. And then another piece of the follow-up is now people are questioning the auditors, so, of course, right? And to, uh, in January, they, uh, they call them both, uh, EY and PWC, were um, accused of just not noticing this liability buildup, this missing, because when the cash register is short, that's liability, right? Where's the money? Somebody owes it to us, et cetera. Um, and during the whole entire time is EY, right? And so now they're gonna start facing scrutiny from uh, an independent investigation. So this story is gonna be going on. It's just amazing that it took a television show to cause justice to start being served over this so why would the auditors be at fault in this well the auditors when you're you're using your job to assess the i'll use the quote truth and fairness right yeah With the uk postal service in the report so if you see like this balance for like i'm sure it would probably go to like something called cash drawer overages or shortages mm. or something right wouldn't that like why is it so big right like because like, the issue was that this Fujitsu software used at the point of sales and all of these 
sub post offices were, was double counting transactions. Sales, yeah. Sales. So, so that, that credit, it would not match up with the cash. And all they'd have to do is go to one location probably for like a week period and yeah. watch all the real sales, count the inventory, yeah, like count the cash and figure it out. Like yeah. they missed it. Well, like it's, everybody it's, missed this. It's, be, it's because that's not their mission. Their mission is not to, the mission of auditors is not to discover the truth. <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, it should be, in my opinion, it should be closer to that. There should be more of a duty to that. But yeah, no, they weren't looking. They didn't want to I mean, know. My guess, considering the post office knew, the UK post office knew, Horizon knew, who was the company owned by Fujitsu, my bet is EY knew. Some, 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 the, the word's going to come out. Some intern, some, some junior staff figured this out, reported it up, and nothing happened. Because mm-hmm. there's just too much money. There's just too much money in this. So going back to this um, crypto and China thing, I have a stat on that. New York Times published an article in December about the outflows of money. They're going, it's going out of the country via crypto, uh, but also small gold bars, real estate. Chinese buyers are becoming the main purchasers of high-end apartments in Tokyo. And an estimated $50 billion per month has been moved out of China in 2023. $50 billion per month. So per I guess month. that's, that's what, $600 billion for the year. Now, China's got a $17 trillion economy. So $600 billion out of $17 trillion, I guess it's not that large, but it is a lot. So... This is a bad sign. And, and I got, guess mm-hmm. the question I would have, when they're moving this money out, is this 50% of their assets? Is this 10% of their assets? Are they diversifying? Or is this like, I need to move 90% of my assets out because I'm scared? Like, I don't know. But I mean, if, if the economy is... These numbers are humongous. Right. If the economy is you know, $17 trillion and we've got $600 billion leaving in a single year, to me, that's a lot of profit. Right, or a lot of wealth that is is exiting the country. I wonder what the implications of that are for the global economy. Right, if China really entered a severe recession, they say they had five percent growth, but those are official numbers, so we don't know if that's true or not. Well, that's the stick. But it's media, it, right. It's interesting. What's so fascinating about this is that. I grew up with this narrative that China was going to be the next global superpower that replaces the United States. And that is clearly not what is happening or what is going to happen. When you look at the effect of the one-child policy and you look at the, the, the impact of uh, Xi and the policies that have been in pla- put in place where the the political situation, the economic situation has become more and more controlled by the central government, right? Who was the guy that disappeared all of a sudden, the founder of Alibaba? Yeah, he, he vanished for a bit. Yeah. Like, and I so, think COVID hurt their manufacturing because the supply chains, everybody realized it's too risky to have your stuff only produced in China, right, in one country. And so, they, so there's some percentage of manufacturing that's being distributed around the world now that yeah. only China had before, you know. Hey, you know, I'm going kind of off topic, right, of the accounting podcast, but I feel like this is an important story that has gone unnoticed, and it involves numbers, so I want to highlight it. Do you remember hydroxychloroquine, David? That's one of the COVID things? Like COVID, you... mis- COVID misinformation. Misinformation, right? okay. So this is an anti-malaria drug that uh, was popularized as a COVID treatment or preventative something. Like people, basically people took hydroxychloroquine to prevent COVID because they heard about it online or from influencers. I think Trump was even talking about hydroxychloroquine. There was all this misinformation going around. And researchers have 
found in France, they've done a study and they think that 17,000 deaths during COVID were caused by people taking hydroxychloroquine. 17,000. And that's only in six countries, France, Belgium, Italy, Spain, Turkey, and the United States. In lieu of getting a vaccine or in lieu of other medical treatment, they just took this instead. Despite clinical evidence supporting its effectiveness, it was administered to hospitalized patients in those countries, and they estimate that 17,000 people died. Now, let's just put that in perspective, right? Like, this is the power of misinformation. Um, you know, 3,000-something people died in 9-11. In, in Israel, just in, in, the, in the attack, in the, in the recent war, right, um, it's been about, what was it, one, 2,000 Israelis died, and now we're talking 20,000 Gazans. 17,000 people died taking a drug that had no clinical use. And that's just, only in six countries. Imagine what it could be globally. Yeah. It's like this is the power of 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 information, and it, I just it, I I constantly have to like look at these numbers and put this into perspective, right? Going back to this whole Waymo thing, right? We we hear headlines where like a Waymo car in San Francisco, or I don't think it was Waymo, it was a different car, like runs over somebody, one person, right? And they didn't even die, and we're saying like, oh, we can't we can't use cars, these, these self-driving cars, right? We have to put numbers into perspective. Yeah, it's, it's the whole, like, people's fear of sharks, right? Like, you're right. Like, in general, people do not grasp numbers very well, right? <laughs> That's right, the shark the, week. The, you, the odds of you getting bit by a shark are, like, basically zero, right? The odds of you getting in a car crash are much higher, right? Or even people do this with plane flights. Flying, yeah. To, yeah, yep. driving is far more dangerous than flying, but people are terrified of flying and will drive instead. Yep. Yeah, even with this uh, recent Boeing thing where the door popped off, right? Yeah. It's still way, it's still way safer to fly. Have you... I, I don't know how this is t ties to accounting yet because I don't fully understand it, but have you been paying attention to this uh, Supreme Court decision they're deliberating on with the Chevron decision like essentially i'm going to summarize it like this because i don't really fully understand it and i'm trying to see it does it re and maybe some listeners might know but apparently there's regulations and some fishermen i think in new hampshire have to they have to have some regulator on their boat while they're out there fishing and they have to pay the regulator even though the regulator is like a government employee but they have to pay that and the fight is that if you're going to regulate the industry or where regulate we shouldn't have to pay the salary of that person. It's kind of this, this decision. But I'm trying to wonder, like, is this going to affect, like, audit? Is this going to affect the accounting industry? Have you followed this story at all? Or Yeah, so maybe maybe no. we will more as the weeks go on here. I'll just send, it, send it to me. I want to read it. Okay. What else? What else? My uh, personal information might have been leaked. What happened? So, as you know, I have a framework laptop, right? And so, and the reason I love it, because I can take the pieces apart, put it back together. And last year, um, at the end of the year here, I had to buy a new keyboard because I tend to wear out my backspace key and my control C, control V keys on keyboards. And I didn't, I wanted to replace a keyboard and that's why I bought this laptop because it's not, it's just screws. There's no glue. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well, turns out, apparently they had a breach. So the framework company, the framework company. So are you wondering why they had a breach, Blake? Because the their accounting firm was tricked by a threat actor. Oh, no. So, so the threat actor pretended they were the CEO and said, hey, can you send me on January 11th? Send me a spreadsheet with uh, everybody's outstanding balances and email addresses and names for the purchases. And the person they sent the spreadsheet out to a threat actor. Now, those those email addresses could always be used for other spamming in the future. I don't know for sure if I was in that or not. Um, I was right around the time I did do that order. So now Framework says that the all of Keating Consulting employees with access to Framework customer information will be required to have mandatory phishing and social engineering attack training. 
um, and they want to um, audit their own internal standard procedures on information requests. But this is, again, like firms don't send this stuff out. Like that's really dangerous. Well, David, yeah. well, it's an accounting well, firm's fault. Are you ultimately. getting um, what is the thing they, they do in this case is they send you an offer for like free identity theft yeah, monitoring? Yeah, I didn't get that yet. But you didn't get yes, that? I have 10,000 of those, but this one hit home a little bit. It's a little more personal. Hey, so we were talking about self-driving cars, and here's a tax story related to that. Um, I mentioned that person that got ran over in San Francisco by the self-driving car just a moment ago. So that was a cruise car, GM, yes, owns cruise. And uh, they've been testing these in San Francisco, which, you know, bad idea, honestly, to test these in San Francisco because San Francisco is, is really, as a city, not very friendly to technology companies testing their hardware on city streets. And GM has now had to file a lawsuit against San Francisco. San Francisco is trying to tax GM for $108 million over seven years, despite the automaker having minimal sales and virtually no staff in the city. And the way the city is trying to do this is they, they're saying that the presence of the cruise self-driving unit will link GM to San Francisco and yeah. that San Francisco is entitled to a part of GM's global revenue. And it's a crazy number, right? <laughs> so, so GM's global revenue is $3 billion. So they're saying that $3 billion is subject to city taxes, which is $108 million. And GM is saying, of course, that Cruz operates independently from GM and only started generating modest revenue recently. So seems like a reach to me, right? <laughs> a little bit. No physical locations, no dealerships. They only sold $677,000 of retail goods in the city in 2022. Um, San Francisco must really be hurting if they're if they're stretching like this to try to get money from GM. I I have a hard time imagining that a court is going to side with San Francisco in this case. But if they do, why would any major company want to do anything in San Francisco? Yeah, because they're again? not suing them because it was tricky accounting or they're playing some games the way Microsoft has done that. Like this is just like yes, we have a presence, but it's a subsidiary that only makes. It's two hundred thousand dollars of revenue, right? It's some ridiculously small like, amount. Yeah, like seven hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I have a city government story that's more of a feel good story, Blake. Okay, uh, let's do that. Feel we could end with a feel good story. Hopefully, I say this correctly. The Pequea Township in Pennsylvania. So they had their board meeting last month, and they unanimously approved their their budget for twenty twenty four because all the expenditures and revenue were all in balance. But the, they were planning to raise taxes by 5%. But what happened is they rolled out a new accounting program, and the employees discovered they didn't account for $55,000 in revenue properly. And because of that, the last-minute budget changes allowed them to have a, budget, a balanced budget and no new taxes. So, like, accounting saved the day. Like, How much was it that they were uh, off by? $55,000 in revenue. It must be This township must be really teeny. But, <laughs> this is but a story have, in the news? Yeah, they didn't have to raise taxes It's good because they changed accounting systems. Like, there you go. Accounting saves the day. Saves lower taxes thanks to an accounting system. Well, David, that's all I got for today. It's been great to see you. I'll be back in Scottsdale next week. We're going to record on Tuesday, I think, and we'll be catching up on listener mail. And you're going so, to a wedding, so ask the I'm, bride where she got her dress at. Was she a member of their prom program first? Like how this worked out? When did when did the prom program start? Because I think it started I, I think, last year. I think my so. my peer group is is yeah a little older yeah, than we'll that pass now. That. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm just glad I could keep up on the slopes when I was skiing. We got so much good snow. It was we got so lucky. Everyone's been talking about how you know the Rockies haven't gotten enough snow, and a, a series of storms just dumped on us uh, the week before and during. So we got a we got a bluebird day. We got a powder day. Uh, right now is a great time to go to Park City and ski. So uh, if you haven't made it out this season yet, it's now you should go. Yeah, it's, it's file extensions for all your clients. And yeah, put ski. all your clients on extension and, and check out for a couple of days. Brandon, thanks for joining us. Brandon says, great episode, guys. Glad I could catch it today. Thank you, everyone who joined our live stream. We love interacting with you. 
You can send us your listener mail, um, whether you listen live or not, at the accounting podcast at earmark.me. We've got a bunch of mail in the mailbag. We'll be catching up this week. And uh, we really appreciate hearing from you and all your thoughts. I, uh, I hope you're having a great busy season, if this is the busy season for you. And we'll see you around. Bye, David. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.